Hello bearded bee people. Welcome back to Bee and K Bees for the long awaited second portion of our beekeeping crash course. So this is the first video of the second portion of our beekeeping crash course. And this second portion is about managing your bees. It's uh, kind of jokingly entitled how to be a good beekeeper. Um, it should include all of the necessary information uh, and at least give you a, a really good idea as to what it takes from you to be a good beekeeper and not just a bee haver. So this first video is on preliminary thoughts, things to consider before you get your bees. Uh, and so let's just get right into it. Okay, so are you ready to get bees? Um, I talk with a lot of people who had been thinking for years about whether they were ready or not to get bees. And then I talk with other people who gave very little thought into it bought bees and just jumped right in. Uh, and probably, you know, something in between those two is correct or is uh, advisable um, because, you know, you're going to make errors. Bees are going to die. This is not a hobby, not a profession that you jump right into and know everything and immediately see success after success. There are going to be mistakes, there's going to be dead bees, and you're just going to have to learn from those mistakes and learn how to uh, avoid them going forward. Um, so, you know, by the fact that you're watching this video, uh, you're already well ahead of a lot of the people that I deal with. Uh, you're out there looking for information, um, trying to find out, you know, good sources of information and uh, what you should be finding out before you're getting bees. And so that's great. I think you're, you're ready. You're at least on the right track. Okay, so uh, another thing to consider, and I'm sure that the vast majority of people who get bees consider uh, uh, the possibility of incurring bee stings and uh, the phobia that comes along with that is something that you should probably deal with or at least confront before getting a bunch of bees and, and spending a, an incredible amount of money on your new beekeeping hobby. Um, so the, the reality of bee stings is, uh, firstly, honeybees get a bad rap by yellow jackets and hornets and all types of other uh, stinging insects and uh, you know generally their stings don't hurt as much they aren't as likely to sting and the rate of people the percentage of people that have sting allergies is incredibly incredibly low I hear uh, a lot of people tell me that they're deathly allergic uh, way more than the statistics uh, allow. And so what I think generally when I hear that, unless these pers these people had to be rushed to the emergency room because their throat was closing, generally I think that they had a bad reaction, um, a bad local reaction that scared them and so that they considered themselves deathly allergic and tried to avoid bees after that. It's not necessarily a bad thing to consider or a bad assumption to make, but it's probably wrong, um, and even if it is correct, there are things you can do in terms of desensitization treatments. Um, but regardless of all that, uh, most sting phobia is caused by a yellow jacket or a bald-faced hornet or some other type of stinging insect, and very, very few, less than one half of one percent of humans are allergic to honeybee stings. When we first got started keeping bees, um, you know, we had a mentor that lived down the road, he still lives down the road, and uh, Katie and Katie's mom were incredibly afraid. I was definitely more afraid than I am now. I wouldn't say I was as afraid as them um, of getting stung, but Katie, I think, went uh, our first four or five years uh, as beekeepers without getting stung at all. And so that, the point I'm trying to make there is uh, you don't have to get stung to be a beekeeper. Wearing the proper protective equipment and taking the proper precautions as you're working your bees is in the vast majority of cases more than enough to prevent yourself from getting stung. A full bee suit, socks pulled up over the, the jeans, and uh, proper use of smoke and all that, and you are not likely to get stung at all. So stings do not have to be uh, uh, an inherent aspect of beekeeping at all. Um, another thing to kind of think of is to try to work your bees on days that they're likely to be uh, gentle and, and uh, allow you to get in there. And those are generally uh, nicer days than today. Sunny, warm, calm days. <clears throat> and then another thing to consider is that when the bees start to act aggressive or start to act angry, 
not freaking out, not flailing your arms and running, because that is exactly what most animals throughout the evolutionary history of honeybees do. And so that'll, that'll exacerbate the issue. So if you see me on this channel getting stung, and I'll probably, you know, pipe in a, a video from last year or the year before to kind of showcase this. If you see the bees getting aggressive toward me, my immediate reaction is to slow down or completely stop. Not to yank my hand away or to act freaked out in any way. If my hand is over, over the top of the hive, it's going to stay there and act very gently as I'm moving across. And that anger, that aggressive defensive behavior uh, is likely to die down very, very quickly. Here is the video that I had uh, clipped into this presentation, which was uh, me last year talking about how to work a large and busy hive. And I do get stung in that video. I will show you that clip right now. You are crushing some though. And I'm getting stung right here. This is the first one of the day though. <laughs> And you'll see that uh, as I got stung, I remained calm. I, I didn't freak out. I didn't flail my arms around at all. And I didn't get stung another time. Those bees stopped becoming you know, aggressive and defensive. They calmed right back down. I gave them a little bit of smoke and everything went on as normal from there. Had I flailed around and freaked out, it probably would have gotten worse. Um, now, worse with honeybees, uh, non-Africanized honeybees, doesn't mean thousands of stings, but it might have meant a couple more. Uh, but with me only getting one and not getting another one after the start of that defensive behavior, I think that's a pretty good example of how proper management and proper working your bees can dissuade those bees from being angry and defensive. Okay, and then as your anxiety around your bees starts to wane and dwindle, um, I think that it's advantageous, it's a good thing to start uh, being a little bit more daring, start working your bees with a little bit less protective equipment on, start uh, being a little bit more involved and maybe take your gloves off because only then are you really going to be truly 100% comfortable with your bees, only then are you going to be you know, able to do just absolutely everything that you need to do on any day you need to do it. Um, so yeah, working with less protective equipment and becoming more and more comfortable working your bees I think is a good thing to do. Definitely don't rush it, don't do that before you're entirely comfortable, uh, but I do think that's something to work for. Okay, so now how much does beekeeping cost? Uh, that depends greatly on how you go about, uh, go about buying the stuff. You can build your own equipment, you can catch wild swarms, you can get a split from a buddy. All these things will allay the costs to some degree. There is always going to be a startup cost, though, um, unless somebody's gifting you a beekeeping operation. There's going to be treatments you need to buy. There's going to be, you know, equipment. There's a protective equipment. There's a smoker. There's frames. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you need to acquire. Um, but this usually, most of these things are a one-time startup cost. So I generally say, and this is really, really general, that the standard costs for equipment for the beekeeper are about one to four hundred dollars per beekeeper, and the standard costs for equipment for the bees are about the same, about one to four hundred dollars, depending on how you acquire them. Okay, and then bee purchases. Uh, I have a typo here. It says one to four thousand dollars per hive, but I think that that's another uh, one to four hundred dollars, and that is, uh, once again, it's, it's greatly dependent upon how you purchase these bees. You can get them in a few different ways, so we'll talk more about that in future episodes of this beekeeping crash course. So other costs that you probably haven't considered are the mite treatments and the sugar um, and an awesome camera to take pictures of your bee stuff. Uh, that stuff, once again, it all varies in price, but it is not free. You are going to have to buy some of that stuff. All right, so uh, when you're starting off, understanding, uh, da, da, da. yeah, so all depends on how you get it. Um, you know, do some searching around. You might be able to get some used stuff. Try to make sure that you understand who you're buying used stuff from because that can be a dangerous thing. 
uh, but generally beekeepers I think are pretty good people and so if you find some used equipment uh, I wouldn't be too afraid of doing that um, but also you have the opportunity to build your own equipment and to catch your own swarms and all that kind of stuff if you're really worried about the cost. Okay and now finding an adequate home for your bees it's a common misconception that you need hundreds of acres of open meadow uh, to keep bees. And I think that it's a common misconception because generally people don't understand the way bees do things. Uh, but I know people who keep bees in downtown Detroit. I know keep, people who keep bees in New York City. Uh, I believe there are some bee clubs in and around Chicago. So my point in that is uh, you definitely don't need all of that open acreage because your bees are going to fly. They're going to fly over buildings. They're going to fly to about a three mile circle. And so that's definitely beyond your line of sight. Um, so if you live in an area with a, a decent amount of natural forage or live in an area with a lot of manicured lawns and all that kind of stuff, generally your bees are probably going to be able to find enough food. Uh, the next thing to consider are the local laws, because I know that in some cities and some residential areas there might be some kind of ordinance against that, so definitely check to that. Um, but generally, I think more areas than are usually considered good for bees are okay for bees. Like I said, I know people in downtown Detroit that keep bees very successfully. And then once you've found a, a beekeeping yard, once you have the piece of property picked out, the other considerations for me are a windbreak and a clear view of the southern sky. Um, the southern sky in the northern hemisphere is very important, especially if you are in a, uh, a northern latitude, because in the winter we really need that uh, warmth to allow for these bees to be able to regulate heat and to be able to stay on top of what portion of the winter they're in. Um, so I found over my beekeeping career that a clear view of the southern sky is very important. Um, also a windbreak between your bees and wherever the prevailing winds come from is also a good idea. Uh, for us we're in West Michigan so the vast majority of the wind comes from the west and north and I like to have my bees blocked at least to some extent to those directions. Uh, but other than that, my number one thing for a bee yard is clear view of the southern sky and that it hasn't had any uh, crazy amount of bear activity. Okay, common misconceptions about beekeeping. I thought that this was a, a, a useful thing because I talk with beginning beekeepers constantly every single year and I realize that these misconceptions are extremely common. So I thought I would dispel some of them here. Uh, the first one is that uh, bees are a wild creature and we're only giving them a home. Uh, I can see why this is a, a common misconception because there are wild bees. We have wild bumblebees and mason bees and carpenter bees and there are some wild honeybees. But in general, the honeybees that we're dealing with are more akin to livestock. They've been selected for honey production and uh, docile temperament for hundreds of years and for that uh, we've kind of left out the Darwinian natural selection that would have left them in a better way of uh, defending against diseases and parasites. So much like a dairy cow or a, a domestic horse, they need our attention, they need our help, they need uh, treatments, they need management. They're not wild creatures and they're very, very likely to die if you treat them as wild creatures. Another misconception that I think useful to dispel is that you'll never get honey during your first year as a beekeeper. Um, you're not going to get a crazy amount, I would agree with that, but I, would in, I do encourage people to take at least a frame uh, during their first year because I think that that's a valuable thing that first year can be very frustrating and that time of success and that time of enjoyment and uh, uh, fulfillment when you're tasting that honey for the first time out of your hive I think that's an important thing to keep the drive and motivation to be a good beekeeper alive. So I encourage you to take a frame and to feed back sugar. You're not uh, harming your bees by doing that. Uh, I know a lot of people think that the honey is the natural thing and that the sugar is a detrimental thing, but that's not the case at all. Uh, we need sugar inside the hives for carbohydrates to get through the winter. And uh, there's not a cleaner source of carbohydrates than white granulated sugar. 
So I'm not advocating that you feed only sugar to your bees, but taking a single frame of honey and replacing it with a frame of syrup is in no way going to disadvantage your bees. So definitely take some, enjoy it, and uh, look forward to your second year as opposed to you know only dwelling on the frustrating aspects. Oh, okay, and then another misconception that's kind of uh, akin to something we had talked about earlier is that you need to plant hundreds of acres of available forage for your bees. Uh, unless you have a, a farm with thousands of acres and you've got you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to put into uh, seed and maintenance for these crops, you're very likely to not have an ability to really benefit your bees by planting stuff. Um, so once again, uh, to kind of try to remove your mindset of worrying about what's immediately surrounding your bees and realize that your bees are going to fly for miles in any direction. Um, so generally planting stuff for your bees is better for you as a beekeeper just because you get to see your bees on flowers than for your bees because the few flowers that you have the ability to plant aren't really going to do that much benefit. If you are looking to plant something that will help at some point, then uh, flowering trees can do a, a lot more good than even a few acres of wildflower. Uh, okay, um, a common misconception is that a wild swarm or wild bees, uh, but that touches on something we've already talked about. Generally, uh, the vast majority of colonies are managed colonies and so a swarm that you consider wild is likely something that had left from some beekeepers hive somewhere and you should consider them as managed bees and uh, uh, deal with them as such rather than hoping that they're a wild creature that don't need your help. Um, now that doesn't mean go ahead and treat all your bees all the time. I definitely advocate that you do mite counts and, and treat only when necessary. Uh, but don't automatically assume a wild swarm that you caught is, in fact, wild bees, because that's very, very likely not the case. Another common misconception is that once you've treated your bees, you don't have to worry about mites anymore. We'll talk a lot about mites in the third part of the crash course, but that's just not true. Mites transfer from hive to hive in completely illogical and unexpected ways, so you have to absolutely be mindful every single month of your mite load. Uh, and do not consider your mite management fight done after you've treated one time. That is a, that's a good way to have hives die and not think that mites are as big of a deal. Um, so definitely check every single month, check before and after treatments. But once again, we'll talk a lot more about that stuff later on in the third part of this crash course. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the biggest threats to your bees health and survivability, the biggest threats to uh, your bees being able to live through a long and arduous winter. The number one first and foremost threat to your bees in every respect is without a doubt the Varroa mite. We'll talk a lot more about the Varroa mite in the third part of the section, but I really, really want you to realize that they are everywhere. They bring with them many types of diseases and direct parasitization effects. They're, uh, they're little bastards and we need to take them very, very seriously. Okay, some other threats to your bees are disease. A lot of diseases are either brought by the varroa mite or exacerbated by the varroa mite as the bees' natural immune systems dwindle. Um, so disease can be a big issue, but usually they're paired with the mites. Um, management error, a lot of this you can't avoid as a beginning beekeeper, you're going to make those mistakes and sometimes those are the absolute best lessons. You can definitely learn from my mistakes by watching my YouTube channel and some other beekeepers on YouTube as we share our mistakes to the collective community, but you're going to make your own and you're just going to have to try to learn from them as you make them. Uh, and then I mentioned starvation. Uh, starvation is a threat. It does kill a lot of bees. That's generally because people don't realize how much honey and how much sugar bees need to make it through a long winter. Uh, but as you, you know, progress in your beekeeping, you'll, you'll kind of uh, get better at that and, and uh, your, sur your starvation dead outs will, will really stop. And then another threat to your bees are pesticides. This isn't something I can think about quite as much as these other ones um, because generally it's hard to avoid agriculture 
and uh, I just try to make sure that if my bees are next to a yard or a farm that is going to get sprayed, that I have a close relationship with that farmer and that they are going to give me a heads up or that they will spray at night. Uh, and generally, if they give you a heads up or spray at night, you're not really going to have a big issue. Um, but yeah, pesticides can definitely be damaging to your bees and being mindful of what is being sprayed around your bees is definitely a good thing. Bears are bastards. Um, bears have uh, wrecked quite a few of our yards over the last couple of years, so bears are definitely something to consider. Uh, bear fences, solar electric fences are a good deterrent for that, but we tenor, generally tend to just move our bees uh, as the bears find these yards and try to spread them out as thin as possible and not have too many hives per yard so that one bear can't do us too much damage. Um, and then I talk about other winter issues. You know, winter is a, a tough time for our bees. So cold and drafts and winter storms blowing covers off and all types of stuff can happen in the winter. Um, but generally, you know, the, the more important things to worry about are the varroa mites and the food the health uh, and keeping pests away. So that is the end of our first video, the preliminary thoughts video. Uh, I hope you guys are digging it. Um, we'll, we're going to have these videos coming out every single day for the next at least couple weeks. Um, so the next part is on getting started with your bees, managing your bees. So uh, like I said, thanks very much for watching. Get out there and have some fun with your bees. Leave me any questions in the comment section below and I'll be happy to chat with you about them.